So our next speaker um, is Tammy Mims, and she is at Jeff Davis Hospital over in Hazelhurst, Georgia. Many of you know her. Um, there are a couple of our speakers today who are um, local. Uh, all of you care about rural health issues and rural health care. Some of you display your passion a little bit more than others, and Tammy is one of those. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Tammy as we go forward this morning. So y'all welcome to Thank you. I'm just not a good podium person, so good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk, and um, as Doug said, I do have a strong uh, passion for health care. I kind of grew up in Savannah and was at uh, Memorial um, Hospital and uh, for 30 years, and so um, I really grew up there with a, a lot of um, other people and learned a lot. Had the opportunity to go to my first rural hospital in Effingham, which is Springfield, Georgia, and learned a lot. And then most recently, about 18 months ago, um, um, uh, had the opportunity to go to Jeff Davis, which is in Hazelhurst, um, Georgia, and um, become the CEO there. So, um, you know, a lot of things. I had heard Tim uh, speak at a conference, and I thought, wow, when I grow up, I want to be Tim. I said, you know, look at what he's done. And, you know, he doesn't say, you know, woe is me, I'm only a small hospital. And one thing that um, I started, even when I left Memorial and went to um, Effingham and then Jeff Davis, and I have a couple little sayings, but I always said, don't let size define you. Don't let size define you. So if you're a 25 bed hospital, your patients are as important as Memorial's 600 bed hospital. And so to me, a patient is a patient. So I grew up as a clinician and I still have the uh, passion for patients and keep my license as well. And Tim's out, you know, doing his EMT and I'm a respiratory therapist and have um, active license. I did have to put a stethoscope on the other day and walk the halls and anyway, that was Halloween. But um, <laughs> I just, you know, scare, scare um, a little bit. But, um, but I did keep my um, license active and I do volunteer work to um, still um, continue with my continuing education because I think that's important. And I try not to lose the sight of the patient um, a lot of times whenever I'm sitting behind the desk and sometimes having to make those um, tough decisions. But um, my um, presentation is real kind of simplistic, but um, you know, I learned early on that if you've seen one rural hospital, you've seen one rural hospital. And so, um, unfortunately, I don't think there's a silver bullet out there that says this one size fits all. And here's the, here's the handbook. Now go and do these four pages and you got it. I just don't think that's going to solve um, all of uh, rural's issues. But this is a little bit to give you some content of, you know, context of where, who we are so you kind of can relate. So we're located in Hazelhurst. It's Jeff Davis County. We have a population of uh, a little under 15,000. You can see where our median household income is and our person's in um, poverty. And our hospital opened in 1963 and we became a critical access hospital in 2004. And so we have a small medical staff, uh, primary care, we have one pediatrician, we have emeritus um, uh, staff, that means they don't take call and they have um, other, they've done their time as they like to say. We have some courtesy staff where we have general surgeon, psychiatrist, and dentist, and orthopedic surgery. So here are the services, they're not much different than most everybody else's, 24-hour um, emergency department, do have enough the surgical floor. We have an intensive care unit, which I thought that was odd, but it's a four bed intensive care unit. And um, we do have a swing bed program now. 
Um, we do have lab, respiratory. We have imaging. Um, we do do um, minor surgeries. We do have respite, hospice. We do provide sleep studies. We do have one practice. And then our Harmony Center is our outpatient um, behavior health program that we started not long ago. So this is our payer mix. I'm sure if you look at it and you say, well, yeah, I've been there, done that, seen that. And so you can see our Medicare, Medicaid, and then our commercial and then our self-pay. And so we, we have been one that had probably more insurance than in the past with the um, um, account care. However, our bad debt did increase as well, which I'm sure everybody can relate to that um, a little bit as well. But we average about 36% um, reimbursement, you know, on the dollar. And I think our um, board, the hardest thing for them to understand is the financials, you know, and I think y'all will probably relate to that as well. So here are some of um, the improvements that we've made um, since I, I got there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about leadership and accountability. And um, I try not to live in the past, but I will tell you, I think it's important to know what are you coming in after? Because the organization is a little sensitive to certain things and before you maybe step into something, you might want to know a little bit about the past just to help prepare you. Because sometimes I would attempt to do things and I would sense oh, something not right why are they responding this way but if i would have known the past then i would be much more sensitive to say uh, in the past maybe they felt like they didn't get enough information so maybe i need to be a little bit clearer with this um, but um, we're going to talk about um, looking at some programs of um, outpatient behavioral health and um, our primary care practice we did implement a swing bed program and then when i first came in and actually interviewed for um, the position, I really had a strong conversation with our um, hospital authority on, are you looking for a quick change and a quick fix, or do you truly want to sustain this hospital? Because to me, that was important. Because a quick fix is something that is done very um, quickly, of course. But most of the time, those changes and that transition do not stick in an organization. And I believe that a lot of places are trying to implement the short-term fixes to maybe we will look better for a short period of time. However, you can go back and see they're not going to stay in place. They're not going to be the true sustainability. And so when we really got some clarification up front on the difference of that, that really kind of set the uh, platform for the relationship between the CEO and also the hospital authority and also um, the items that we ended up um, implementing within a short period of time. So um, part of our five-year sustainability plan um, the key components were revenue cycle, cost containment, and growth. And so, if you look at leadership accountability, um, you know, I've probably spent, and I know um, um, Lou and I, I don't know if Lou's here yet, but um, talked last night because he just had his year um, anniversary in his new position. And um, when I first went in, I did a SWOT analysis, and I did a SWOT analysis on every leadership position. So the first day that I walked into the office, I said, you know, I need to see the organizational chart and I need to have a meeting with all my direct reports. And most CEOs, you know, would do that. Little room filled up. And I said, hey, how are you? I'm meeting with my direct reports. And they're like, yes, ma'am. I'll report to you. And I'm thinking, Lord, is anybody else out on the floor? I mean, who's taking care of the patients? 26 people. 26 people. Now, we only have 112. <laughs> I thought that was a lot. So, we did, we did a SWOT analysis, and then we started looking at um, leadership development. Because one of the things that I found, and, not, and I hear from other organizations as well, so this really isn't just Jeff 
Jess Davis or um, Eskenham that I have experience with, is we've had where we've done things in rule that we've always done it that way. Has anybody heard that, right? I've always done it that way. I've been here 40 years, and you ask, why is it, why is it done that way? I've always done it that way. Well, have you considered this? Oh, mm -hmm. we always done it that way. So you're like, okay. So you have to figure out, well, maybe, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but is there a better way, right? But when you look at leadership development, when I ask questions, a lot of people didn't have the answers because it was the CEO did that. The CEO attended that. The CEO made that decision. I was like, oh, wow. So we spent a lot of time on sustainability is you can't grow your organization until you grow your people. Because it, you, can, you can outgrow your organization if your people aren't ready to support it, but you won't have a strong foundation to then sustain it. And so everybody wanted to, you know, go get business, go do this, go do that, but we had to grow our foundation so then we could support that external growth. So we spent a lot of time on our SWOT analysis of individuals, we had a leadership development. We started with basic, um, you know, communication and basic um, doing personality um, tests and all the things that, um, you know, you think people would have had done. But we, you know, we have people 37, 44 years that have never experienced any of those things. They've not been made aware that those things were available nor did the organization uh, put the focus on that. So um, we looked at the reporting uh, structure. Um, and I told them, you know, I really, I can't get my arms around 27 people, but I can get my arms around six or seven. And then I'm gonna build you six and seven to where you need to be, and then you're gonna go build six or seven. And then it's going to then transpire throughout this organization. And that's really what we've done. Um, so we changed the organizational chart pretty quick. Um, you know, we did have, you know, where you have some board members call and to say, you know, I know, you know, Miss Susie. Susie likes reporting to the CEO, so that's really not going to work for her. So then we would go back and say, remember when I interviewed? And then we talked about transition, change, and sustainability. I'm telling you, this is not something you want to have a discussion with, and this is part of the sustainability. You know, she's not going to have her job changed. She doesn't need to report to me. She's in a position that needs to report to another, and then together, they will all grow. So, um, once we had that discussion, that it's worked fine. Um, did everyone stay? No, no. A lot of people chose, and they came up and said, I understand the organization's changing. That's not for me. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. I've always done it this way. I don't want to learn new. And so I'm leaving. I, I'm leaving on good terms because I want the hospital to be successful, but I, I'm now making this choice. And that, and that had to be fine. So we've had to replace some, but we've had to look at other people in the organization to say, you know what? You're really in the wrong position. You're, I know you're in this, but your skill set is much better for over here when you take that challenge. So we've had, we've had a lot of movement. Um, we've had a lot of growth. Um, we looked at monthly reports. Um, one of the things I say is a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And so when you make rounds, I'm a, I'm a walker. I'm not in my office very often. Um, I walk the halls. Um, I, I find out more in the hallways than I do probably, you know, in my office. But um, I would go around and make rounds and ask every single manager, tell me about your department. Tell me. Um, in the emergency room. Um, tell me about your um, emergency room. Well, um, we see patients. Okay. That's, that's a good start. Good. Um, how many do you see? We see a lot. All right. Could we put a number on that? Well, I, I've, I've seen, um, today I've seen five, she's seen two. So we've seen seven, and I was like, okay. 
I'm going to come back in a week. I want you to know these three things. I want you to know your total volume for the month. Total volume. I want to know how many people are leaving that you're not seeing. Let's leave before being seen. That's going to be an important number. And I want to know people's wait time. Well, but she, her eyes got bugged out, you know, and and she was like, okay. So I said, I, trust me, you go search. You can find that. It's going to be here, there, whatever. You get to a point where you can't find it, you let me know. So she came back several times, but I did it in every department. So everybody's like, oh. she's asking a lot of questions. I asked more questions than I gave answers for the first 45 days. Because, you know, they all walked in. And as they went into the room, they looked at me like, okay, give us the answers. And I told them, I, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what I don't know today. But you know what? I'm going to find out. I'm a quick learner. But so will you. So will you. So in a week, I did the same exact rounds. And they all knew. They were calling each other. She's coming. She's coming in. She's on her way to the It was worse than joint commission being in the back. You know, you know, and everybody's texting everybody. And so, but and I asked them the same exact questions. And you know what? Every single one of them knew the answers. But you know what? They stood up more with pride. They took ownership. They felt like they had more knowledge than they have ever had. But no one had ever asked them. No one had ever engaged them. And so, you know, part of that was to um, get them to own it and get them to be a part of it. And so we started monthly reports. We started looking at stats. And we actually created a budget. You know, and people are like, oh my gosh, you gotta have a budget. Okay. Um, we have a budget. They have been, you know, educated on budgets and variance reporting. And they actually participated um, since I've been there for a while on building the budget. Um, you know, they just, um, we just had our year-end uh, report on Monday, and you know um, we we're, we're very fortunate that within a short period of time we've gone from two days cash on hand to 107 days, which is pretty good. Um, we've gone from uh, average daily census of 1.7 um, to about 14, which is that's pretty good. Um, we've gone from losing 1.7, 1.5 million for multiple years. To having a positive bottom line um, of uh, about 600,000, and we've got um, money in our uh, reserve account um, that we're saving for um, some projects of the future. We have cash in the bank. Um, we're doesn't look like the doors are going to close for next paycheck, as one of the employees said. I asked him. I said, "All right, let's let's name our successes, and um, we're we're going to put them up on the board because if you don't keep." You know, reminding yourself of your successes, you kind of forget them. And sometimes you need to write them down because then you appreciate the magnitude of them. And so some of them, you know, um, one person stood up and said, you know, a year ago, um, I worried for me and my family, was I going to get a paycheck in two weeks? And I think the success is I no longer have that worry. And I can put that energy towards making improvements and really doing better patient care than worrying about me. And so I think, um, I think, you know, doing some of these things is the transition and the pain of going through change um, always very positive? No, because as soon as you say change, everybody takes that as a negative and it's like, oh, here we go. But I tell people, it's not really the change, it's the transition in going through it. But after you implement some of these things, then you put them back in the same room and say, okay, remember when we came out and we said, what was one of the worst things we did? What do y'all think one of the worst things we could have done in the last 12 months that involved our employees? What would you think? What changed? What would be major? Close reporting structure. Could be a reporting, but reporting structure. To them, changing their scrub cover. <laughs> Who would, who would have known? You know, so you think, okay, that's what y'all want to talk about? And I thought, okay, that's what we'll do. So, do you know why we change colors of scrubs? Do you know that there's research out there that says that if you're a female and you work in a hospital, you're a what? Nurse. 
If you're a male and you're in scrubs, what are you to a patient? A doctor, right? So when I would go in and make rounds and talk to patients and they would say, um, my nurse wasn't gentle with my arm and she drew her blood, right? Well, I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna have a conversation with that nurse. Well, it wasn't the nurse. Who was it? Phlebotomist, right? So you can't go and peel back those things and make improvements and address those specifics with people if you don't know who they are, you know? And so the for patients, because I always say, what color scrub did they have on? They had on blue. Well, blue's a nurse. They had on black. That's a tech. They had on green. That's a risk for a therapist, right? And now you can walk into a room if they have a code, and I can say, there's there's x-ray there, there's two nurses, there's a doctor, because of the colors. I don't have to know every one of their you know, faces or whatever, but, so after you explain that, they're like, okay, we got that. But you may just change our color of scrubs. Well, yes, but it was for a specific reason. But did any of that now for the last 12 months harm you? No, and they like it. So if you go back and it's not the change, it's the transition of some of that, but go back and then the next one, you know, they're preparing for is maybe not going to be as bad as, you know, they think. So leadership and accountability uh, were a large component first off of um, what we did. And then we started, once we had a people uh, component, uh, and that's never ending, you know, we all continue to improve. I learned something if not every day, every week. I read anything and everything I can get my hands on, talk to people, you know, anything that Tim thinks he can do, I'm now going to go try it as well. Um, you know, some things that uh, we did on, um, you know, you kind of have to know your audience, you have to kind of know your board, and I knew, you know, I had one or two that a couple of key topics were real important, but they are always the one, hey, it's all the agenda, I don't even think it's going to be, you know. So I would always put their agenda item of interest at last. <laughs> and they'd say, could we move this up to the front of where the seat? Well, the agenda's kind of sad. <laughs> so they then start staying with the meetings, right? So, you know, you, you, you gotta learn, learn your audience, you know. Um, be able to uh, know how to maybe uh, be creative in, in some of those things. But when we started looking at programs, so we continue to work on people, and we started looking at programs, you know, what we did at Memorial and what uh, we were able to do at Effingham might not always, might not work at Jeff Davis. So that's that, if you've seen one, you've seen one. So we really had to go in and dive in and look at our uh, market identification and say, what, is, what are the needs of Jeff Davis? Not, you know, what do I like to do and what is everybody else doing? But what are really our needs? And then, so we've got a lot of data. And most organizations have a lot of data. I think, there's Luke. Um, we had a conversation last night. There is data, data, data. Um, however, if no one's looking at it and you're not doing anything with it, then it's a waste. So we started diving in and looking at our market and identifying um, you know, what are needs of our market, and then we looked at our out-migration. You know, how many hospitals can survive if you have over 70% leaving your community, driving right by you, going to someone else? So, when we looked at the out-migration, we had to start with our own employees first. All right, that is not part of this presentation. <laughs> I'll always be known that I've turned the lights out. Now's the time to sing. There you go. They didn't pay the bill. Hello. Well, y'all don't have to. Y'all don't have to see me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Should I keep going? Yes. All right. We don't have to be on video. I'll, I'll redo it for you. I can hear you. You're good. Okay. <laughs> so we started looking at our out migration. We found that we had in our own health plan, we had our own employees going to other facilities for services that we could perform. 
And so when I started having team member meetings, I said, how can we stand in Walmart and how can we go to all these community events and say, use our hospital, use our services. And then when they say, oh, well, Timmy, where'd you get your mammogram? And I say, oh, gosh, I, I got mine in Savannah. Okay, but you're telling me to have mine? How could you do that, right? So we implemented in our health plan that if you have health insurance with us, if we provide the service, then there is no in-network option other than ourselves. You're doing good, but I'm going to get you to move back this way a little bit, and I'll oh. hold the microphone since it's not working anymore. She's recording. <laughs> <laughs> just talk up. Okay. So, so. I can hear her. She's, she's, she's good. good. Oh, no, we're good. Okay. Just, oh, you can't see it, can you? Uh-uh. I'm not yeah. that, quite that good. Oh, okay. Well, you can wander over here. Today. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so she can capture you. Okay. So, um, so we, we implemented that. We saw a 60% improvement within months. And if you don't market internally, then you have employees in your facility that don't know what you provide. They know their silo of my respiratory therapy department, but I didn't know we could do CT. My husband needed a CT, right? I didn't know we had a surgeon coming now. I didn't know I could have had my gallbladder out here, right? So we're, we're missing that opportunity. We think our people know what our services are, but I'm telling you, they don't until we tell them. And then they will be our best marketers, because whether you have 100 people or 200, you want them to be your best billboard, right? So the other key component was looking at the out-migration and saying, why are people uh, leaving for these items? And then we created a component called I'm Listening. And so um, I'm sure somebody else has had that slogan. But we looked at uh, some of our complaints. We've looked at some of our leave before being seen. And then I invited those people that were randomly selected, right? <laughs> and I brought them in and said, you know, I want to introduce myself. I want to give you a quick tour of the facility. And then I'm listening and I want to hear from you. For once, I'm not going to talk much, but I want to hear from you. You've lived here all your life, just like Tim said, the several generations, but I want to hear from you. What's good, what's bad, what's ugly, and if you could change anything, what would that be? Number one, you find good future potential board members in that group because you'll find those gems that are key interested that truly want to do something. You'll find potentially a donor of $300,000 because their passion for the ED is so great and they have a family trust that they will give you this check if you promise to make improvements in the ED. So those things to me are simple and then you start gathering more uh, community uh, involvement and you actually can use those items for um, um, other uh, things as well. And then the other is medical staff. You know, how many hospitals can survive without physicians? None, right? So you can't have an adversarial relationship with your medical staff. Now, you can't allow your physicians to run the hospital either. And you have that of, uh, if you don't give me call pay, I'm going to take my patient somewhere else, right? So you have to work together and have a common goal. And sometimes it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Um, physicians like data, right? They don't want you to go up and say, you're not using the inpatient um, criteria correctly. You need to say, here are the patients. You need to have the case manager there. Here are the patients, and you wrote this. It doesn't meet, you have to give them the facts. Don't just, you know, do um, part of that. So part of it is to um, collaborate with them and um, to just continue um, with the uh, relationship. But also, ask your physician what programs are important to them. 
because um, you know they they probably have um, patients and they probably then will say I see a lot of diabetes I see a lot of cardiac I see a lot of whatever in their primary care and then you can say what can we do to support your um, practice with that you know would it help to either have a, a health fair and maybe just focus on uh, cardiac and would you like to you know be involved that we could maybe do um, you know a luncheon and you could even speak on how to be healthier um, and this that, and the other and so involve them they have a lot of good um, information and let them see you to be a strong uh, extender for them and um, a very good uh, collaborator. The other key component of our revenue cycle with our sustainability was our charge master. Every hospital has a charge master and every charge master should be reviewed annually, right? So do you know some rural hospitals have never had a price increase? Would you even imagine that? So do you know that you can't then find that out and immediately catch it up, right? Because you have contracts that say you can only increase a certain percentage uh, within a time period. So you have to then do a gradual increase. But um, you know, those are some of the details that someone is not managing that. There's either a lack of a skill set or someone assumed somebody else was doing it or we've always done it that way so that you know 10 cent for that aspirin needs to stay 10 cents since 1963 or whatever it was so um you know we ended up looking at our charge master and comparing it to the market and seeing what opportunities we had up there and then what about upfront collections who in here does upfront collections right so we we had no upfront collections because those were our family, friends, and neighbors. So we, we don't do we don't do that here. Okay? Well, your family, friends, and neighbors, do they have Medicare, Medicaid, or insurance? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So they chose that. And so part of that plan says that they will have a portion. I didn't make that rule. Their insurance company did. So now we're going to assist with them being, you know, in compliant with their plan, and we're going, to, we're going to take up their money, and we're going to help them understand how much that is up front. So, you know, you can start that, and it can be anywhere from 10, 20, 30,000 a month, depending on what your um, services, you know, your volume is. So that's straight to the bottom line of upfront collections. So we scripted. We had education, we um, monitor it, because what you monitor is what you are going to then manage. And so uh, we um, rewarded those team members, um, had a meeting and said, hey, you know, I want to uh, recognize Mark. He collected the most, you know, this month. Yay, Mark, we're going to have a pizza party and Mark gets to choose the type of pizza, you know, because he collected the most. And, you know, next month you're going to want to choose your pepperoni and you better collect some more money then. You know, yeah, there you go. So, um, you know, so try to, you know, engage them and, you know, it's, you got to, you got to show them and then you got to keep them accountable and, um, um, and then reward them as well. The other items with our revenue cycle were grants. We started looking at, just like um, Tim said, on some of those weird <laughs> grants and, you know, what's out there. Um, we as an organization weren't familiar with what is available. Now, we don't have a certified grant writer, but I have a fabulous hospital that's a friend of mine, it's Vicki Lewis here from um, Coffee, that's about 30, 27 miles, something like that, Vicki, down the street. And she has a person that is a, 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 a grant writer, and she assisted us so we could uh, work on a grant together to. Um, um, potentially um, be able to collaborate and do some good things for our community that um, you know nobody had thought of in the past. And so, look at the grants. Look at the other opportunities that are um, out there for the assistance for your revenue cycle. So we then had a component, a key component of cost containment. I mean, that's what everybody thinks when you come in and you say you're going to change or you're going to have sustainability you got to cut cost. But really, 
for a critical access hospital is cost good or not? Right? Well, it's like a lawyer's question. It depends, right? So it depends. So just like Tim said, you have a huge cafeteria. Is that good? No. We all close now. We, we are close. And we've got a larger radiology area now because the cafeteria is small, right? That's better use of that space, right? So, so we might have a longer cafeteria opening to let our employees go in there, but it doesn't need to be a large um, space. And so you have to look at what's the most appropriate um, cost. So we re renegotiated every one of the contracts. I, we got the contract list. I called every one of the vendors and said, I know we have this agreement, but we are a hospital that has two days cash on hand. I need you to be a good partner, and I need you to help us out. I'm hoping it won't be forever, but for now, we have got the cash flow, and we have got to do this speedboat you know, turn, and we're like the Titanic, and we're brushing up against that iceberg, but we don't want to sink. And everyone was very receptive. Now, you know, you had some of those that are like, mm, you know, whatever. But they all participated, and then we, yes? Five minutes. Okay. And then we were able to um, come back and um, readjust those over time as our success has done great. We looked at staffing. We implemented a staffing model. Um, we reviewed all overtime. We reviewed call pay. We looked at all of our supplies, and we were able to join other groups for um, um, uh, cheaper um, supplies. Um, under our growth strategy, we looked at all of the programs. Um, we worked with our medical staff. We started working on patient safety, looking at our falls, looking at our medication errors. Um, we looked at all of our quality and core measures, and we spent the majority of our time on community perception. And the majority of our growth has come from our community perception. <coughs> because you'll have those of 10 years ago, my grandmama came, and this, that, and the other, and I'll never go back there. And I ask them all, come back today. Don't come for a service, come for a visit. Meet with me, walk around, and you won't, you won't see anybody, most of, most of them aren't here from, you know, how many ever, now 10 years, yes, but, you know, long, long ago. But you'll see, tell me if you see a difference. And if you don't, then you tell me what that difference should be. Majority of them seen it, have seen the difference. People are smiling. They speak to you. They don't tell you directions. They actually walk you to areas. And so different, different things like that. But if your community perception does not change and you don't engage them, then the overall sustainability is not going to work. If the community does not support the um, hospital, then it, it really is not going to exist. We receive no county funds except, and I was told don't ever say that again, um, splash. We get about 200000 a year, um, and it's used for capital equipment, and we are very, very thankful for that, but we have no subsidy. So after about um, the first probably nine months, I had a combined county commissioner meeting, city council, and our hospital authority, and I said, here's where we've been, here's where we are, and here's where we're going. And I, I want everybody to tell me, do you agree with this plan or not? And be honest, be honest, because it's not my plan, it has to be ours. And, and, and let's agree that this is gonna be it, we're gonna meet every six months, and then I'm gonna update you, I'm gonna be transparent, and you're gonna have input in this. Will you sign up? And we, we had, Standing room only, you know, it's 50-50. It's either going to go good or it's going to go really bad. We ended up having a very, very good, productive meeting, and we were able to have people come up afterwards and say, I know you don't get money from the county, but if you get to the point where you've done everything you can and you need it, you call us. That's the relationship we want to have. We want to be able to remain independent and do it ourselves. However... If we do everything possible and can't, we need to be able to have that um, opportunity. 
So on um, future programs, we um, are going to look at um, um, doing some further things with orthopedics. Women's health, and um, you look and say, well, do you deliver babies? No, we're one of those that quit that years ago. But our community has a high, as we're one of those that had a real, real high jump in infant mortality. And people said, well, that doesn't concern us. We don't deliver babies. And I said, yes, it does. Because we don't deliver babies, it concerns us more. So we worked and collaborated with Coffee, this, um, you know, 30 miles down the street, they deliver babies. And I said, we have no OBGYNs in our community. We need OBGYNs. We need these mothers to be seen because they're high risk mothers and babies by the time they come and almost deliver in our ER, which we don't deliver babies, but we have had to in the past, right? But then when we transferred those, now they're high-risk moms and they're high-risk babies. And sometimes the higher organization keeps them, or sometimes they go to Macon, sometimes they go to Savannah. But then they come back, and a lot of times those, ba those babies have developmental problems. Who's that helping? Who is that costing? It, it, it's not a good outcome for anyone. So we've collaborated. We have um, two OBGYNs that come every week. They see our patients. And we're going to monitor that, and I'm hoping that we're going to see a difference in that mortality rate. Now, what does that do for Jeff Davis Hospital? Well, we, we get some revenue from some lab work and some ultrasounds at the physicians, but it is helping the community. We are going to truly make a difference in um, those families' lives and the overall impact to um, the community. So we're looking at uh, we were one care. We have uh, been awarded an inpatient um, behavior psych unit that um, in December we will start making the ED improvements from the donation we received. And in January we'll start digging the dirt to add on an additional 8,500 um, square foot building for 10 bed um, inpatient behavioral health unit. We have implemented our 340B pharmacy program. We've implemented our visiting specialist. Um, we have a cardiologist coming now to see um, patients as well. And then we've started our clinical collaboration um, really with um, coffee that's been more open um, than other organizations to say, we have this need and what can you do together? Um, and so every critical access hospital has a network agreement, right? By the Balanced Budget Act that says we have to, where's Lisa with the State Office of Rural Health? Isn't she here? Oh, there you go. Right, Lisa? So we have to have a network agreement, right? Yes. For being critical access. It has to be uh, where you have key components to say you have a higher level of care and you work on that relationship. Do you know, which, does that need to be recorded? Lisa, don't listen. Do you know the majority of critical access hospitals have that agreement? They get it signed and they put it in a folder, right? So we're actually going to, to um, redo our agreement and we're going to change our partners and we're actually going to utilize that agreement to collaborate with that organization and have our CNO have a higher level CNO at this other. I'm having trouble. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, and have, have that relationship and that resource. You know, have our infection control nurse or risk manager be able to have a phone a opportunity friend right down the street to say, how are y'all working with implementing flu vaccines with your employees? You know, that's not competition. That's not gonna, that's not gonna hurt coffee or, 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 or Jeff Davis. That's collaboration. We're going to then, you know, start looking at those patients and how do we seamlessly look at the full continuum of care for these patients and not have them get dropped, you know, in the middle. And so, you know, the overall days of competition and everybody fighting for those patients or whatever, you know, I, I think, you know, we need to almost call a truce and say enough's enough. There are plenty of patients out there and with population health, uh, coming and not you know if it's just when the majority of us get on board and start being changed from volume or uh, to value um, and when that'll hit critical access who knows but a lot of it is just good medicine and it's just what we should be doing if we truly care about having healthier communities.
So, you know, my presentation is not the, um, you know, the latest and greatest and glitziest or whatever, but, you know, my point is, you know, if health healthcare is tough, just like Tim said, my mom always tells me, if it was easy, Tammy, everybody would do it, right? And so we know that. However, there are some of those most simple things that aren't easy to do, but anybody can go in and do just that. Lou's done a huge job within the 12 months, you know, that he's been at his place. So sometimes that, we've always done it this way, doesn't work anymore. Because healthcare is not how it's always been. People that have been in healthcare 25, 30 years, it is nothing like it, like it used to be. And so that, we've done it like that always, is not going to work. So we have to challenge ourselves to say, doesn't mean it's right or wrong, it just means, is there a better way? And I challenge everyone in the room to go back and look at some of those simple things that you think are being done correctly, and you ask yourself, can they be done better? Thank you. question or two for Tammy before we take a break. I think Tim started his whole presentation about this is about collaboration, this is about expanding, it's about re-identifying services and things like that and I think what you heard from Tammy obviously was a continuation of that same thing.